Now, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I did it. Okay. So, NALI, and, which is the National Association of Women in Law Enforcement, and IACP, which is the International Association of Women in Police, did a study. And so are we doing better? Well, right now, there's 12% women in top administration, and there's 2% women that are sheriffs, chiefs, directors, and CCJ. So there's no studies. We, there's no studies I've done. It tried to figure out Black, Latino, officers of color. There's nothing out there. There's only of women. So we're not doing great, but we're doing better. Um, I think it's going to get worse now with the George Floyd because I have found with my students, um, I have students now coming to me. I, I'll give you an example. I had a female come to me um, and tell me that her sister, her family, she wanted to go into law enforcement. That's been her goal throughout her whole time at SOU. And everybody's given her a hard time. Why is she doing this? Why would she want to go in and be and go in and I mean, just all the bad things you can think of and harass people and be awful. And, and, and I'm like, Alyssa, you're doing this for the right reasons. You want to help, you want to make a difference. So I, and I'm seeing that a lot more. I, I think it's going to be positive for community justice. I'm seeing a lot more interest in careers such as community justice that require a bachelor's degree. Um, I know I'm pushing it more. And so I think you guys are going to see a lot more interest um, because of um, what you do and how you do it and why you do it. It'll be interesting to see in the long run. Um, I think law enforcement is definitely taking a hit, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. All right. So again, know where you've been to know the path where you are going. Mistakes can be avoided, learning from the past. I always believe we have to take responsibility. And this is kind of an interesting little icebreaker. Since instead of how to do things, I'm your host, Michelle Aiken. And on today's episode, I'm gonna teach you how to not be a leader. Tip number one, blame everyone else. You are a leader, which means that you are not and can never be at fault for anything. Admitting that you've done something wrong is just showing weakness. And no one will respect you ever again. So make sure that instead you disrespect everyone else by never owning anything. Tip number two, micromanage. Trust schmuss. Your team is probably incompetent. Therefore, don't give them autonomy or they might get ideas about how they could be a leader one day. All right. Tip number three, as famous for shooting Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr once said, talk less, smile more. Don't share your opinion on anything and better yet, don't have any. Just wait to see what everyone else is saying and then kind of glom onto that so that you never have to be responsible for what you thought. All right. I love that one. Okay. Go on. There we go. I love that one. How not to be a leader. We've never had managers like that, right? Never not take responsibility. Have you ever been in a room where somebody, your leader said to do something and then it goes totally wrong and then the leader just sits in the back and doesn't say a word? Oh my God, that is my biggest pet peeve. Your good leaders will stand up right in front, even when it's not their fault and take ownership for it. All right, now we're moving on to our next topic, which is diversity in leadership, which is so important. All right, cultural competency, promoting equity and promoting inclusivity. Examples, first of all, um, and I didn't ask this, so. Eric, I'm going to ask you guys, does community justice have an EAP, an EAR, or an employee assistance program? Yes. Okay. So it's staffed by um, employees. Are they just employees? Are they leaders? Are they employees? Who's it staffed No, by? good distinction there. We actually have an EAP program that's through like clinical psychologists locally that you can go and just obtain regular counseling through. Um, but we don't have what you're describing, like a peer network of supports yet. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I just a suggestion, I recommend that. It's always good just to have peers, somebody, just to have that support, especially, and let me tell you for your leaders, it's really good when they are um, 
mentoring or not even mentoring, but when they are speaking to their employees or subordinates, um, and we're going to go over some real life examples, it's always good, especially, and I hate to say this, but when things go bad and you have that bad employee, it's really good for documentation, especially if it goes down to an ERB, an employee review board, or goes somewhere that you have recommended um, an EAP within your area. Just a thought, just a thought to put it out there. Um, and then I'll move on. All right. Um, all right. Also, um, with SOU, um, we have what's called a gender, sexuality, and women's studies. I know this isn't something you're going to have, but what we do offer, and I recommend this to you, is um, there's nowhere else in the country that offers this. Um, there's another, it's called J studies, but it's, um, it's really expensive and it's only through colleges. We offer this and I can get you hooked up. It's through um, Dr. Soika, it's transgender and career training. Um, I, I have found that many people are, I'm gonna use the word ignorant. We just don't know how to refer to people. We, we're, we're, we're ignorant because we're just like LGBTQI, um, are we here, are we there? And so we don't use it or we're scared. And she comes in, she teaches the GSW, she comes in and it's for free. And she opens up the doors on transgender queer training to your staff and um, she just opens the doors on the terms, on what's acceptable, on what to say, and she removes the veils. And she takes cultural competency to a new level. And she, she just promotes equity, inclusivity, and you feel empowered. Instead of feeling like, I don't really know, and I, I kind of know, but I just know transgender, and I think I kind of know, you just, it, it opens all new doors. So if you're interested in bringing something like this um, to your team members, I'd be more than happy to set you up. It's something that I think is really important. It's out there. Um, and I just think the more knowledge we have, the more empowered we are and the more assistance we can provide. So I think it's very important to provide our leaders with this and our team members with this. So I'd be more than happy to, I, we are in the country foremost with this. Like I said, we in the country provide this. So it's just amazing that at SOU we provide this. So I can give you more information if you're interested in that. Um, also, I'm sure you're providing implicit bias training because um, that's just big. Um, there's different resources. Um, I always recommend that leaders put this out there, um, that there are resources, there are multicultural resource centers, and you know where those resource centers are. You as a leader need to make sure your employees know that there's resources out there. I always made sure as a leader that I knew my local resources. I was aware of them. I was up to date on them. And when I met with my employees, I didn't. I, I would, again, be very careful. There's a difference between picking and getting too in depth with an employee of personal matters. You can always say, hey, how are things going? Is everything okay personally? You can say that. You can't say, hey, um, what's going on with your life at home? You know, tell me, you can't say that. But you can say what I said at first, and then you can say, hey, there's a lot of resources as we provide. You know that, right? We've got, you know, EAP. There's a multicultural resource center. There's a women's resource center and then, but make sure you document that. We're going to talk more about this, but you need to make sure as a leader for your employees that you are telling them this and then you're documenting it and having them sign this. This is huge folks. If you're not doing that, this is big and it can go bad. And I would rather document it and not ever need that than not say it, not document it and need it because I've seen it go bad. So 
this is big. We've got a lot of resources in our community. You guys are around SOU again, which is culturally so competent and amazing with so many resources. And I can help provide you with those with what we offer with all these resources. Um, but you do need to let your employees know it's that kiss, keep it simple, stupid mentality, but you do need to tell them, you do need to document it and you do need to have them sign it. Um, and I'm hoping you're doing that when you're meeting with them quarterly and documenting it somehow that you're meet, leaving it in their file, whether or not we used to have, um, I kept like a three ring binder and then I would make notes um, in a file that I kept on my computer and I would print those out every three months and I would have them initial and sign it. So I don't know how you guys are doing that. I'm sure you have your own system. And then once a year we did performance evaluations that that would go to the HR, to their files with human resources where that three ring file folder um, that had, you know, it had um, different files in it as far as evaluations, it had commendations, it had the notes that were printed out. Every year that would go with whoever their different supervisor was, depending where they were at, you know, the different um, shift they may be on or the different department they may be in, things like that. But you need to be noting what you're recommending to them. These are positive things because believe me, if things go bad, they're gonna come back and say, you didn't tell me this. So you need to be telling them. And these are really big things that we have here. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, next, community partnerships. Um, we are in an era, you need your community. Um, you guys need your community. Um, there's three examples of ways to utilize your community. Um, there's lots of different ways. I'm just gonna give you, let's put it this way. There's lots of different ways. I'm gonna give you some different ways to utilize your community. And Eric, I would put somebody in charge of this. I don't know who it is or who that would be, but um, number one, you need some type of volunteers. Um, I don't know if you have them, if you have a volunteer, do you have a volunteer program already? Um, no, okay. Um, some type of Citizens Academy. You do amazing things. I'm telling you, social justice is where it's coming. It's the focus is on you. I'm telling you, the focus is coming on you guys. Um, and so you need some type of Citizens Academy that shows what you guys do. Um, or some type of community watch. I, I don't know where it is. It lies within here somewhere. Um, I don't know if you guys ever do any type of use of force or if there's a review board, who knows if it is. I don't know where that falls. I don't know enough about what you guys do. Um, I'll tell you how we utilized it. Um, all it has to do with is transparency, okay? We utilized it, we had volunteer, we had a volunteer group and we chose one or two volunteers to number one, sit on, you know how you do your oral boards? One of those volunteers that we trusted was on our oral boards. So we had a citizen on our oral boards. It was great. They provided great feedback. And then it's great to say we we involve the community on our on choosing our officers. Isn't that great? And then number two, we utilize them once a month. We had a use of force review board. Now, obviously, officers are going to be using more use of force than probably your probation officers, but we had a citizen on our use of force review board as well to provide that citizen feedback. So again, we could say transparency. There is a citizen on our use of force review board. So again, I don't know if you have something like that, but you're gonna be more able to say where you can apply that citizen. And again, once you get a volunteer group going, you're gonna be able to know who that citizen is and better apply that citizen. Some citizens are gonna be able to utilize that, but you need to involve the community with your process so that, cause that citizen is gonna be your soundboard. Whenever the news media comes around, they're going to be amazing and they're going to be taught. Oh, the, the transparency is just, they're invaluable, invaluable. Um, I, I, and I can tell you there are some out there and that they want to do that. They want to give back and they're just amazing. So your community partnership is invaluable. You guys are going to be at the forefront with social justice. You need that community partnership. However you do it is up to you and how you base that. 
All right, also being creative and challenging the norm. So I'm gonna thank Tara for this. Tara found a great article that's really lying where um, we are as leaders and where we're going. There was so much to it. I kind of picked out some of the highlights um, as far as what we need to look at in the criminal justice field. So how do we do that? Number one, I, I kind of laughed, but it was so true um, in that, what time is it? 10 o'clock. Um, we'll go to about 10.30. Are you guys good with that? 10.30 to take a, okay. Um, number one, Murphy hates us. Oh, I love this one. How often have you felt that? Oh my gosh. Or the bear eats me all the time or whatever, but negativity bias can be of value to implementation leadership. So basically says things go wrong. Gosh, is that so true? We often are required to deploy new legislative requirements. You know, I, I told you I met with our chief and I asked her, I said, so what's the hard part? Is it what you thought? Cause I used to work with her in CSI too and stuff. And she goes, Tiv, it's the legislative. Eric, does that sound familiar? The legislative stuff, you know? She goes, oh my gosh. Um, so Murphy law, Murphy's law applies. What can go wrong will go wrong. Therefore, planning for challenges by tapping into our propensity to hyper-focus on what could go wrong allows leadership and implementation teams to foresee both technical and adaptive problems and develop contingency plans for them. To create an environment where problems are welcome. I know this is so hard, right? This is so, these next few slides, you guys, are so atypical for me because I'm a type A person and I went to the academy where you don't make mistakes. And if you make a mistake, you run a grinder, you do those push-ups. I was the one in the video where you did the push-ups and my butt was up in the air, you know, because I could only do so many push-ups. But these next few slides are so true of where we're going. They, you know, you're creating a pro an environment where problems are welcome. That's how we learn. If you don't fall and fail, how the heck are you gonna learn? If you have to be perfect all the time, how are we gonna learn? That's why you guys, it took from the, the 1900s until the 2000s to get women in law enforcement and officers of color in law enforcement because we were so scared to fail. Uh, followers and experience, yeah, yeah. So can we have a quick second? I was wondering if Tommy would be willing to talk about how the PTO model has kind of embodied some of this and what that shift looked like and how, yes. how that was to implement. Sorry yes, to put you on the spot, please. Tommy, but not that sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, no problem. So, you know, trying to really summarize this so I don't take up too much time, but really the PTO model is focused on a problem solving method where, um, you know, it's failing forward. We learn from our failures and we encourage folks to go out and try their own way, try their own style. Um, they're going to have those failing forward moments and we learn best from our failures uh, there for the longest time. You know, I think in this industry, making mistake was frowned upon. And when with what we're seeing with our trainees right now is they're able to not learn the do as I say, not as I do type thing, but really going out and learning different ways of doing things, making the mistakes, and then taking those learning moments and putting those towards their problem solving abilities. Um, it's been a blessing for us to introduce this to our staff. I think we've had a lot of successes with it. Um, we're still learning through this program, but for the most part, it is based on one of those, um, those models where failure is accepted as long as you're trying. We got to get out there. We got to make those mistakes. That's how we learn. That's how we improve. Very true. Thank you. I agreed. So agree. So agree. Thank you. I appreciate you doing that. Okay. I'm going to just make this slow. All right. We also have another one of the ideas was adapt or die. Many change initiatives that die on the vine do so because in large part due to the leadership and problem solving approaches that are chosen. Our impotent levels of change success are impeded by our own approach to problem solving. And as change leaders, we are often working 
to solve the problems we created. Change leaders are natural problem solvers. So look closely to identify and diagnose. Is it a technical problem or an adaptive problem? Technical problems are actually easy to diagnose and they can be solved quickly because those are like black and white problems. Staff don't, don't care if you change them. They're more like policy issues, really quick and easy things. But adaptive problems aren't so easy. They're, they're root causes. They're like a flipping hundred year old oak tree that have deep roots that are going underneath the street. They have underlying issues that are deep. And you have to know that as a change leader and you have to be ready to adapt and be ready for what's going to go into changing that. And here's where we're going with what Tommy was talking about. Um, this is the, um, sorry, this is the fail forward and fail often. Um, failure is a virtue while perfection is a vice. And again, this is so different than anything we were conditioned to, especially in the nineties in law enforcement, you know, so different than what we were taught. Um, when we punish and prohibit failure, we create a culture that is inhospitable to implementation and change. Far too often, technical and hierarchical leadership undermines what is needed for people to learn in a safe and healthy way. If people do not have explicit psychological safety to learn, the organization itself will not learn. The most profound learning we experience is often preceded by a failure. The most profound learning we experience is often preceded by a failure. I said that twice because that's so important. If we fear failure, we ultimately fear learning. Okay. And culture is king. Gosh, that's so true in the criminal justice world. Anyone who neglects to diagnose and fully understand the organizational culture will become its victim. Culture in the CCJ sector is king. If you don't believe that, you haven't worked in the CCJ sector. Culture is the underlying ecosystem of beliefs, thoughts, attitudes, perceptions, behaviors, traditions, habits. Need I go on? Since it is impalpable and invisible, it is often neglected. It shouldn't be though. But do not be fooled. It is more powerful than any budget, any leader, any policy, any strategy, any set of politics, and any law. Culture can be a strange and elusive phenomenon, but its impacts are concrete. Implementation leaders have an explicit imperative to understand the organizational science behind culture and how it can inhibit change. Boy, can it. And as if change weren't difficult enough, the criminal, and that's why again, change takes so long. Look at the history I showed you folks, how long it took. The criminal justice field has unique attributes to its culture that make change even more arduous. What do you think? You, can you think of some of the things that um, the criminal justice field has? Well, let's look at those. There's well, competing goals. Yeah. I mean, just, the more yeah. you say this, I just can, I just continually think of our detention and residential programs uh, on the juvenile side and how hard that is to instill some of the cultural pieces that the leaders here have, have worked to try and shift on. Um, you know, on the one hand, you're very much policy driven and procedure driven and we try and do things consistently in the same but then you're also called to meet the individual needs of of youth and you as a staff person have your own characteristics that you bring to the job and like creating that stew where policy and procedure are still consistent and driven yet we're individually addressing the needs of youth and we're doing it in a way that reflects the things that staff bring to the table that is a huge order that's really oh. hard and so I'm just trying to contextualize some of this within that. And it's it really a lot of it comes down to a culture issue to a degree. So you, you hit the nail on the head, Eric. You, you can't do it. It's like, how can you do it? And and then what happens is so many leaders forget that it's even there. Don't even take into take it into account. That's the issue. You hit the nail on the head. So there's competing goals. 
not only the ones you bring up, but within statutes, case law, practices, habits, job descriptions. You brought up one, but let's look at these, the statutes, all these competing goals too. There's role conflict among obligations of deterrence, rehabilitation, offender accountability, retribution, punishment, incapacitation, reparation of harm, cost control. Oh, I forgot about all those. When solving one problem, such as punishment, we compete against the demand to support another of rehabilitation. These are just some, I'm not, I mean, you guys are, I mean, we're fighting a losing battle sometimes. So how does a leader affect change? Culture is not a technical phenomenon and cannot be approached technocratically with checklists and other mechanical approaches. So those type A OCDs like me and some of you that we've talked to that like to do that type A, okay, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna grab my little, you know, calendar, my Excel spreadsheet, uh, 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 don't, it's not going to work. Regulation policies and procedures, it's not black and white. It ain't going to happen. It's adaptive phenomenon. It's those gray areas that require implementation. It's those roots. It's that oak tree that has those roots that go underground. It's going to take all of you. It's all these leaders, 22 of us in a room all together. And it's going to take time. Implementation acumen and organizational acumen to be effective. It's not going to be overnight. Culture is a jar that traps and limits our change initiatives and leaders cannot read the label when they are inside the jar of their own culture and organizational leadership. So, you know, it's just... This is so huge and culture is king. So huge. Take the leap. Effective change leadership requires catalyzing courage to break through the analysis paralysis. The CCJ system is far behind the curve of applying implementation science to its work of discovering new ways of change. Leaders cannot and must not seek to avoid risk in every situation of change. Rather, we must be comfortable with the discomfort and accept certain risks of our uncertain decisions. Courageous leadership is also a scared one. Analysis paralysis is a signal to fail forward, not to, say, to stay inert. Instead of paralysis, we take the leap into uncertainty and learn what we need to learn. Thank you, Tira, for that. That was because of Tira. All right, let's watch another motivational speech. A, real leaders lead well. Real leaders see before other people see it. Real leaders think before other people think it. Real leaders can create before other people create it. See, it's one thing to be a leader, but it's another thing to actually put action to your leadership. Um, leadership is valuable. Um, order is valuable. Timing is valuable. Management is valuable. When a leader moves in timing, management, and has really, really brilliant ideas, that's a sign of a true leader. Uh, some people are called to lead and some people are called to follow. Uh, whatever your leadership uh, gift is, move in it and let the world know that you're gifted. All right. I do not know why you do not want to move on. There we go. All right. So, so what happens if your leaders don't want to change the culture? What happens to that? What do you guys think? What do you do? Oops, I didn't want to do that. I 
I mean, I don't want to see a show of hands or anything like that, but I know there are a number of people on this in this training that have had the courage to speak up. And I mean, I don't want to use the truth, the power thing, but speak up the chain and say, this needs to change and here it is. And to be able to speak your convictions like that, I think it's one of those characteristics of a leader. So. You know, from my perspective, I came in in a former administration of community justice and um, we were doing good things then, but I felt we were very stagnant. Um, since bringing Eric aboard as the director, that's the one, the one thing I've seen that that hasn't been a change since we've got here is we keep developing new ideas. Um, we keep fostering that in a variety of ways, and it's taken that that stagnant feeling out of our department and we have continued programs that feed on each other and it keeps to develop this department i think and for the better um, it's something i would love to see continue throughout my career anybody else It's tough. If you have a leader that doesn't want to change the culture, it's kind of like me when I was in CSI, you know, there was a certain culture. I could have stayed in CSI. That's where I wanted to stay. You know, I had been in for a while. They sent me to a 12 week Academy every year. They sent me around the world to different training. Wow. It was pretty cool. I loved my job. And then I was going to go into supervision and get stuck back in patrol. And I don't even want to talk about my trainers because remember who I told you were the supervision at the time. Um, but nothing's, as you guys know, nothing's quick. Um, you, you don't make a change like that. And remember what you may think is correct may not always be correct. What you may think is right at the time may not always be right. So you continue to educate yourself, you continue to learn, and you continue to make changes with what you can do at the time. And you continue to voice, but you be careful too, because you don't always know what's best and what you may think is best at the time may not be best at the time. Um, so you be careful and you have mentors. That's why I've talked to some of you about having mentors and talking to those mentors and identifying those that have more experience than you and running things past them. Because sometimes we have an idea, especially if you're one, you know, some of us know ourselves and we're, we're fast at pulling the trigger, you know, and if you're one of those, then have a mentor that you can call and talk to. And if you think something's going on, you know, talk to that person, but you know, if you have a, a culture that's not changing, then be that change. And sometimes it's going to take a while, but be the beginning of that change. I was the beginning of that change at my department. It took a while. I'm gone, but you know, now there's a female chief of police and a black female assistant chief of police where I worked. I'm not there to be a part of it, but I don't care. I don't have to be a part of it because that's again, that would be about me. And it wasn't about me. It's about the good for everybody. And that's what you have to remember. Okay. It's not about you. It's about the department. It's about the organization as a whole. So think about that. And sometimes that's what it's about. So start making those changes and think about how to do that the best way and have somebody around to help you. Um, I'll go into the mentoring right now. Um, I do believe we all need a mentor. We all need somebody we can talk to, that we can vent to, that we can look up to. Um, so if you don't have someone like that, I believe you should identify somebody like that. Um, you know, I put myself out there for some of you. If you don't have one, I'm more than welcome to be that for you. Um, because I am outside of the agency. Um, so you have that confidentiality. Um, uh, for others of you, you have identified people within the agency. For others of you, there are, I've recommended organizations. There's other national organizations um, that are amazing because you get, you know, that, that understanding of what you do just because you guys are a smaller organization. 
So you get that feeling of understanding and they do conferences or there's mentors within those organizations as well. Um, but you guys need to have, you know, you need to have identified mentors that you can talk to and then you can go to somebody and, and listen to somebody and it gets lonely when you get up top. It really does. You know, um, I, I hope you're not, I hope you guys know by this level, I hope you're not with your employees going to bars and partying with them. I hope you know that's not acceptable. Um, I, that's my feeling. Um, I don't think it is. Um, I, I, I say that, that it's not acceptable, but I can give you a lot of reasoning why it's not because, and I'll give you one good example right now. And that's why it's lonely at the top. And there's a reason they say that because if you're out drinking at the bar with employee, you know, A, and then employee A does something wrong. And then you got to call employee A into your office and say, employee A, you did A, B, and C wrong. Um, it, it gets really uncomfortable. Um, if you haven't been in that position yet, don't get in that position. And the way to not get in that position is if there's a party, if there's a work party, all you got to do is show up and go, hi, everybody, you know, and have a bottled water and then say after a half an hour, bye, everybody, and let them have their employee fun, you know? So um, that's my recommend, my one little tip to you before I think it's a good time to take a break. Um, it is 1021. Let's go. How about till 1031? Does that sound good, everybody? Give you about 10 minutes. Or actually, do you guys need 1035 or is 1031 okay? 1031 okay? I, I don't know. Let me know. Is that okay? That's good. 1031. I'll see you guys back here at 1031. All right. 